when our church was downtown, we uh, were surrounded by prostitutes and homeless and drug addicts. And, of course, we invited them in for dinner every Sunday afternoon. Had 150 to 200 of them hang out and have dinner with us. And it was fun. But, you know, you can't grow a church out of that because, well, nobody wants to come to a church full of those kinds of people. But we always had fascinating and interesting stories that would emerge. Things that I would call ethical dilemmas or sometimes just ironic, bizarre stories, or sometimes hilarious things would happen. And over time, I began writing those things down, and for a while I sent them out in a newsletter and things that we had, and now I have enough material that it's actually a whole book, and it's incredible. I've got 50,000 pages, or words, I mean, uh, written on, and I uh, want to share one of those with you because it's sort of insightful with the idea of the ethical dilemmas we have, deciding when do you show grace and mercy and kindness to whom and what does that look like? A young couple came to our meal several Sundays back and asked for help. She had just lost a baby in her fifth month of pregnancy. She said the shelter she stayed in had her climbing up into the top bunks because she wasn't high enough on the priority sign-up sheet to get a lower bed. She said she felt something pop inside her climbing into the bunk and not long after she found herself in the bathroom holding a tiny baby in her hands until it died. On a typical day, the shelter kicks everyone out with their stuff at 8 a.m., so she left that morning like all the others, dragging her suitcase behind her, walking the streets, drifting to other day shelters, and wandering downtown with her boyfriend. No, they weren't married. Almost all the couples never are down here. Her health was poor, nutrition substandard, her lifestyle, well, let's just say it was incredibly twisted for someone wanting to bring a happy, healthy baby into the world. Her parenting and social skills were never developed in the family she grew up in. Her only examples in that arena are of what not to do. For the next few days, the other women in the shelter scolded her and blamed her for losing the baby and not taking care of herself, telling her she killed that child with her own stupidity. One or two were kind and compassionate and expressed sorrow to her. In a daze and in pain, she and her boyfriend wandered the streets for a couple more days until Sunday came, and they thought that maybe they would give church and God a chance to move in their lives and see if He still cared about them at all. That Sunday morning, they decided to drift to a church service for the first time ever. Not ours, though. I understood that he had a church background as a kid, but when his mother tragically died ten years before, he left the church and never returned staying angry at God the whole time. After the service, they worked up the courage to go to the pastor, and they asked if the church would help them get a hotel room so she could physically recover and get away from the other shelter women. The church said no, because they weren't married, and it would be a sin, and they didn't want to contribute God's money to help people sin. The guy offered not to stay with her, but go back to the shelter each night, but since there wasn't any way to verify this, the church still said no. They then wandered the several blocks down to our meal on that Sunday afternoon and asked us if we would help them get a stay in a hotel room to recover. What would you say? What would you do? What would you have suggested that we do? For the record, that other church wasn't wrong. I know that pastor. He's a good guy. He's been downtown longer than I had been, and he even gets up extra early each and every Sunday and takes a guitar down under the freeway, and he conducts a church service for the homeless under the freeway each and every Sunday. Often, he gives away breakfast treats, gloves, hats. He does this before his own church service starts, and he does it whether it's rain or shine, even when it snows. They're familiar with street population, too. And they know that half of the stories we hear are lying con games. I wasn't at the meal that particular day. So some of our other leaders had to wrestle with the ethical dilemma of how to help, if at all. They verified the story through some of our street friends. They decided that after losing a baby so soon, fornicating probably wasn't going to be high on the woman's list of activities. So going strictly off compassion, they decided to get her a hotel room to recover in. Do you think that was wrong? Ten years of raging at God, hating His standards for life, living opposed to His moral codes, in rebellion to His word and His ways, defiant against His spirit, in a moment of tragedy they asked God for a touch of compassion through the church. 
Did they deserve anything from his hand? Decidedly, no. Were they complete and total sinners inside and out? Oh, yes. There's much more to their story than I'm telling here. It's a very dark, ugly, and filled with pain and destruction. Was this going to be the moment of change and transformation for them? Only God knows. Would opening that door of transformation by grace through an act of compassion be a good move? Well, we thought, yes. Well, what if we were wrong and they simply took advantage of the moment and went back to the way things always had been? Well, that was a risk for sure. Who was taking the risk? Well, we thought maybe God was. Would God hold us accountable? Probably. But for which action? Turning them away or getting them the room? The problem we face is that we believe in the grace of God, but we really like it when there's some incredible change first on the part of the sinner who demonstrates that they appreciate the grace and they're thankful to God for it and demonstrate through their behavior that they do, in fact, deserve a touch of His grace. But by its very definition, then that ceases to be grace and instead becomes an act of merit. Grace is really tough at the point of contact. But I am, for one, am thankful that when I have been raging at God, hating His standards for life, living opposed to His moral codes, in rebellion to His Word and His ways, defiant against His Spirit, and in my moments of tragedy and brokenness, ask God for a touch of compassion and grace, He still gives it. That's the Gospel. That's why it's called good news. So we bought that couple their hotel room, and I don't know if we ever saw them again. What became of it? I don't know. Should we have spent church money that way? Well, we did. Maybe we were wrong. I don't know. This is the dilemma of some of the acts of compassion and kindness and grace. We love it when the story unpacks in such a way that we have this great testimony afterwards that verifies our love and compassion was worth it. But the truth is, half the time we never get that ending, do we? And we have to ask ourselves, God, what is it you want me to do anyway? We're in a series called uh, Not Just for Kids, where I'm taking great Old Testament stories that we may have grown up with in Sunday school or heard, but we don't really know the meaning of them. And today the story is on Jonah and the big fish. You might have heard it as Jonah and the whale. And I'll tell you why I picked this story, because actually, and most of you may not know this, the entire book of Jonah is little four little chapters tucked away in your Bible right in the middle of the Minor Prophets, and it's not about the fish at all. In fact, the entire story of Jonah is about grace and mercy to people who don't deserve it. And that's why the title of today's message is Grace for Me, but Not for You. So if you've got a Bible, turn with me to Jonah, you've got to probably have to look in your index to find it. It's tucked away in the Minor Prophets way back just before the New Testament. If you're going to use one of these blue and white Bibles we provide, you'll find it on page 632. Page 632 on the Bibles we're providing. Okay, so Jonah. Let me give you a little background on Jonah. We don't know a ton about him. He's an interesting character because he's only mentioned one other time in the entire Bible, and it's in 2 Kings 14.25, where it's during the reign of an evil king, Jeroboam II, of Israel. He's around somewhere around 770 B.C. is when he lived. The name Jonah actually means dove, and we take that to mean peace and kind of this cool thing and love and peace, but in ancient Hebrew, dove meant silliness because it just was a bird that sort of bounced around. Um, he's contemporary with the prophets Hosea and Amos. So there's two other minor prophets that were exactly living at the exact same time as Jonah, and they were prophesying against the nation of Israel. At that time, the Assyrian Empire had risen up to such a point where it had moved down uh, into the northern regions of the Middle East. They had destroyed the power of Damascus, and that was the Aramean Empire. And Damascus had basically been a strong uh, uh, influential city that had, had dominated the Middle East for centuries, and the Assyrians destroyed Damascus, uh, and that was cool for Israel because that, uh, uh, Damascus and the Arameans were the arch enemy of the nation of Israel. Um, for a little bit, the Assyrian Empire was in disarray, 
And during that time of disarray, Israel was able to sort of rise up, get stronger, and take back some land that the Arameans had taken from them centuries before. Hosea and Amos prophesied that a Gentile nation of the east would come and would destroy Israel unless Israel repented of their sins. The reigning world powers at the time were the Assyrians and the Egyptians. Those were the two reigning world powers. This is where our story begins. Jonah chapter 1, verse 1. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship for that, uh, for, bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Okay, I think I've got a map here uh, on the slides. I hope those got inserted. I didn't check those before service. Oh, yeah, okay. So uh, here, here's the Assyrian Empire. It's rising up. It's taken Damascus, the little nation of Israel just above the Dead Sea there, the nation of Judah at this time, Israel. The, the Hebrew people are split into two different kingdoms. They're sort of hanging in there. Israel's a little bit stronger, a little bit bigger, and the Assyrians dominate everything. At this present time, Nineveh's not their capital. After Jonah's life, it will be. But it's, they'll move their capital to Nineveh. But Nineveh is a huge city that uh, is in the middle of the Assyrian Empire. And God is coming all the way down to the little nation of Israel. He's finding his prophet Jonah. And he's saying, Jonah, I need you to go to the city of Nineveh and preach to it because the city is wicked and corrupt and you need to go proclaim its wickedness. Now, Jonah understands something. The only reason God would do that is to awaken them to repentance. The only reason he would be sent there is to be telling them, not only is this city wicked, but God cares about that wickedness. God will have to destroy the wickedness. And God wants to intervene beforehand by having you repent. And so that's the word that's coming to Jonah. He hears God very clearly. And his action is to do this. And I think I have the, the next slide. We'll kind of explain this. Uh, so he gets into a boat somewhere down on the coast of Israel gets in this boat, pays his fare, and he's heading for Tarshish, which is Spain. Right? So here's a guy that clearly hears God, knows exactly what God wants him to do, and does not, not only does he not sit still, he gets so far out of his way, he goes the opposite direction by a thousand miles. He's going to get as far away from the Word of God, the plan of God, the ideas of God as he can get. Why would he do that? Why would you be a prophet who hears God, and you hear God tell you to do something, and instead of obeying God, you go out of your way to disobey Him and get as far away as you can from the fulfillment of having that prophecy come true, or having your responsibility go down. And it had to do with who the Assyrians were. What it comes down to is Jonah looks at the Assyrians and he says, I hate those people so much, they are not worth it, for me to preach to them. The Assyrians, they were, there was a, after the destruction of Damascus, there's this temporary setback that goes down. The, the, the Aramean Empire actually will turn into, a, instead of having a geogra- geography, they will turn into a trade group, a trade people, and their language would actually spread and become the dominant language for centuries all over the Middle East, all over the world, even though their empire had been um, reduced. The the Assyrians, they were a whole different group. They were uncouth farmers. They were peasants mostly. They borrowed much of their culture and their religion from Babylon. So they didn't really have their own. They were a highly superstitious people group. The Assyrians uh, had the king was constantly having to appease the gods with different festivals and different fasts and different things because they lived under this understanding that the gods out there are always mad at us and going to destroy us and we need to constantly appease them. So they had all of these huge fasts and things to all these different gods all year long. If there was an eclipse, it meant that the king had made the gods mad. So what they would do is they would put a puppet king on the throne and they would pretend, here, this guy's the king, and for 100 days he got to rule, and at the end of the 100 days they would kill that guy and his wife to appease the gods, and then the real king would take the throne back again. And that was a common practice for them. They were a bloody and fierce people whose gods demanded blood and whose gods demanded war. A generation before Jonah, the Assyrian king Ashner Asapol II 
marched west all the way from uh, his capital deep in the what's present-day kind of Iran, Iraq, and he had marched all the way to the Mediterranean Sea. And his memoirs have survived his, I use that term loosely, his uh, the records of his attack had survived, and what's actually archaeologists have discovered, his records saying what it was like, what he did. He says, I caused great slaughter, he boasted. I destroyed, I demolished, I burned. I took their warriors prisoner and impaled them on stakes before their cities. After sacking one city, uh, Asher and Asapol stacked the corpses of the dead like firewood outside the gate. Then he skinned the nobles, as many as had rebelled, and he spread their skins out over the piles of the dead bodies. After another battle, in which he killed 3,000 soldiers and took many prisoners, he reported, Many of the captives I burned in a fire. Many I took alive. From some I cut off their hands to the wrist. From others I cut off their noses, ears, and fingers. I put out the eyes of many of the soldiers. I burnt their young men and women to death. See, this was something new. To be sure, the Middle East was used to horror, but the Assyrians had indulged in atrocity before. Now, however, and henceforth forever, um, the region would be confronted by a succession of Assyrian kings who by deliberate design practiced and proclaimed mutilations, flaying, impalements, and other atrocities for the purpose of spreading terror and thereby encouraging submission. They practiced deporting people when they conquered an uh, area. They would take all of those people. They would transport them somewhere else in the Assyrian Empire. They would take a group of people from somewhere else and bring them in. And so they moved people groups around so they could get enough of a group together to ever rebel against them. Nineveh had been founded by a guy named Nimrod in Genesis chapter 10. It's mentioned he was a hunter, a great hunter, it says in Genesis chapter 10, which scholars think it means a killer of people, a hunter of people. And so his, his guy who founded Nineveh, this is who the Assyrians were. And Jonah hears God say, hey, go preach to them that I've seen their wickedness. And Jonah understands the only reason God would do that is to give them a chance to repent. And Jonah's look at them and saying, the one people group on planet earth who does not deserve any love from God, who does not deserve repentance, who does not deserve that chance, are the Assyrians. In fact, I want to see them destroyed. So he gets in a ship to go as far away from the Word of God as he can because he hates the Assyrians that much and doesn't believe they deserve God. He may be right. But in God's eyes, God has a plan. So off he goes. He gets in the boat. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up, and all the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God, and they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck, where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. This captain went to him and said, how can you sleep? Get up and call on your God, maybe he will take notice of us so that we will not perish. And then the sailors said to each other, Come, let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. They cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. So they asked him, Tell us, who is responsible for making all this trouble for us? What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? And what is your country? And from what people are you? And he answered, I'm a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. This terrified them. <laughs> Let's hold right there. So here is a great story, because here's these people. These guys are on the ship, and a storm comes up. Do you think they have encountered storms before? Yes, these guys are sailors. This is what they do for a living. They've been in storms many times. This is the kind of storm that comes through when even the captain and the sailors are afraid. You know it's bad. And they're terrified at this storm. In fact, this storm is so unusual and so wild and so chaotic and acts so differently than any storm they've ever been in that they know this one's being brought on us by some kind of supernatural power. There's a God who's mad because we've been in storms before. We know what natural storms are. This one is weird. The wind's acting wrong. The waves are acting wrong. What's happening to us is acting. This isn't right. There's, there's a God trying to destroy us. Somebody on this boat has done something wrong. And while they're about to perish, probably they were Phoenicians, most likely, 
while they're about to perish and afraid, the only guy who knows God and is aware of God and understands what's going on is asleep in the boat. I just think that's just such an interesting thing, right? It's like he's asleep in the boat. And I can't tell you how many times I think that's an incredible metaphor for sometimes we as Christians are the same thing. The world around us is perishing. The world around us is aware that there's chaos and dread. The world around us is aware that death is at hand. The world around us is, is in fear. The world around us is, is collapsing and Christians are asleep in the boat because, hey, we got ours. We got our peace. Right? Go down in the deep hold and I'll just sleep here and if everybody else dies, I don't care. I got mine. And there's no, there doesn't seem to be any awareness that Jonah's very actions have jeopardized this crew. The captain drags him out from down below and says, how can you possibly be sleeping when we're all about to die? And they're all terrified. They know some God has done this, and they know somebody on this boat's responsible. So they cast lots. That's the equivalent of like rolling dice, right? Highest number is the guilty party. Or it's drawing straw. Short sticks the loser. And so they would do this. And in ancient times, that was actually a pretty accurate way to discover the will of God. So they roll the dice, they draw the straws, and it all falls on Jonah. It's like, okay, we're all going to roll dice. Highest number is the loser. He's the guilty party, and Jonah is the highest. So they turn and say, okay, we, who are you? Where are you from? What do you do? Why in the world are we out here in the middle of the ocean being attacked by your God? What is going on? What have you done wrong? That All our lives are going to get lost because you won't obey your God. And Jonah has to say to them, well, okay, I'm a Hebrew, and the God that I'm, who's mad at me, the God I worship, the God who I have disobeyed, the God who I'm rebelling against, is the Lord of all the heavens, and He made the sea, and He made the earth. You don't get much higher than that God. Right? I mean, in their pantheon, there were gods for the wind, and gods for the water, and gods for the land, and gods for rain, and gods for this, and gods for that. And Jonah stops, and he basically says, the God who's mad at me is the biggest, highest, toughest God of anything you could imagine. And their response is to be terrified. All the other guys, now they're terrified. Now it's like, you have offended that high a deity? You have, def- you have offended the highest of all the gods? That's how their mind would think. And they're, they're absolutely shocked and stunned that anyone that anyone would go to the trouble of violating or hurting or harming or offending one of the lesser gods, this guy in their boat has actually disobeyed the highest possible god. The one over all the heavens, all the sea, and all the earth. No higher way you could get. And so they're terrified now. They know, oh, this isn't good. This isn't good at all. So in verse 10, it says, this terrified them, and they asked, what have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord because he had already told them so. And the sea was getting rougher and rougher. So they asked him, what should we do to make the sea calm down for us? Pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will become calm. I know that this is my fault, that this great storm has come upon you. Instead, the men did their best to row back to the land, but they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. And then they cried out to the Lord. In your text, it's notice that's Lord with all capitals. It means they cry out to Yahweh. That's the personal name of God in the Old Testament. They cry out to Yahweh. Please, Yahweh, do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man. For you, Yahweh, have done as you pleased. And then they took Jonah, threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. At this, the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. Interesting moment. They're like, we are, what should we do? What should we do? The storm's getting wilder. And he says, you should, you should kill me. You should pick me up and throw me into the sea. He's not volunteering to jump in. Notice that. He's not saying, hey, I should jump in. He's telling them, you guys have to end my life, right? You guys have to be the responsible party. And they're looking, look, 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 they're thinking, you have already made your God mad at us already, and we haven't done anything. And now you're asking us to kill the servant of God, and you think your God's going to be pleased with us for doing that? So they actually do the opposite. They fight to preserve his life because they're so afraid of the God that he's worshiping. They're like, no, 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 no. We are not going to offend your God by killing the servant. And I don't know why Jonah just doesn't say, well, I'll jump in. 
There's nothing in Jonah to rescue these guys. And somewhere in Jonah's mind is, I would rather die than preach repentance to the Assyrians. I would rather be a dead man than to see God move with His love on that horrific, nasty people group. I mean, that's where Jonah's at with his heart. He hates them so much, he dreads them so much, that he would rather die, but he's not willing to sacrifice himself for the guys on the boat. He's going to make them do it. Instead, they try to row to shore, and actually the waves get wilder. The closer they get to shore, the worse it gets. Finally, with no choice whatsoever, they pray to God Almighty, God Almighty, Yahweh, please do not hold this sin against us. And they pick Jonah up, toss him into the sea. Most scholars believe Jonah wrote this book. He's the one who survived to tell the story. And so most likely, poosh, he hits the water, comes bobbing up, and he's floating in the water for a second, and as immediately as he's floating there, the whole wind just goes, goes calm, everything goes flat. And they're standing on a boat, looking down at him in the water, and everybody's freaking out now because they're like, wow. If we were wondering maybe this was a coincidence, if we thought maybe we were wrong, if we were like, oh, it's just natural causes, boy, does that ever confirm absolutely this God whom this Hebrew worships is the God of all gods. He's so powerful that the moment we do anything to obey this God of all gods, the entire wind stops, the sea stops raging, it's instantaneously Jonah's floating in the water and observing the guys on the deck, and immediately they drop and start worshiping Yahweh. Now, it doesn't mean that I think they all became converts. It means that they added Yahweh to their existing group of gods they already worship. But at some point, this group of sailors began to understand, oh, there's this higher, more powerful God out there that none of us have ever heard of, we've never known, and we've never worshipped. But I guarantee you, for the rest of their lives, those guys worshipped Yahweh in some capacity. And they told this story over and over. And so there's Jonah floating in the water, just waiting, okay, I wonder what's going to happen now. And it says, verse uh, 17, end of chapter 1, Now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. So I, I can fully imagine this. You've, you're the guy on the ship and you've just tossed this dude overboard, never hearing of his God. You watch the wind completely die down. You watch the waves cease. You watch this, this incredibly horrific storm instantaneously just go, woo, 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 woo. it's all calm. He's floating out to the boat's probably still rocking a little bit. And you're standing there like, holy smokes, you start praying to Yahweh. And the next thing you see is a giant fish come and go, and grab the guy that's in the water. Right? And, you know, they, we've always said a whale, but it doesn't use, use the term whale. And there was a Hebrew word for it. It says fish. Might be one of these. I think I got a slide um, for the next thing, Karen. If you go up and, and advance, it might be one of these, which is what they call a uh, next slide, and it's coming. And baboom, a whale shark, probably most likely. Possible to swallow a guy? Oh, I think so. <laughs> oh, I think so. And can you, what would that feel like to you if you were in the water and suddenly, no teeth, these things feed on algae, right? So they strain uh, water through their little rows of teeth. So it's not going to bite you. It's going to just simply swallow you whole. And it's going to take you down, down inside, and you are not going to die right away. You're going to be down there. Maybe you'll suffocate. Maybe the acid from the stomach will get you first. Don't know if there's air pockets down there. Don't know whether Jonah actually lived or died inside the belly of the fish. And scholars debate, did he live, did he die? If he died, he was clearly resurrected. As a sign later on when Jesus would tell the Pharisees, you will get no sign except the sign of Jonah. And he would be three days, three nights in the belly of the grave. So it's possible that Jonah goes into this fish and down there before he's dies, he writes this prayer, he sings this song, creates this, and either he stays alive somehow down there for three days, three nights, physically harder to do, but since we're talking about a miraculous God doing something, it doesn't matter how physically hard it is, or he died and was resurrected by God to complete the mission God wanted him to do. And the interesting thing is, in chapter 2, he lays that whole song out, and if you read it, I'm not going to take time to, but if you read that on your own, you can see there's very 
huge images of death, Sheol, being in the grave, under the mountains. You get this total impression, oh, he's not talking about being in the belly of a fish. He's talking about being in Hades. And so that whole song he writes, the implication is, oh yeah, he died. Jonah died in that fish. And it says in the very tail end of chapter 2, and the Lord commanded the fish and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. And we're going to reset the scene, right? Barf, and on he goes onto dry land. And you still saw those maps. Dry land is still hundreds of miles away from Nineveh. He has to go marching to Nineveh now after having been in the belly of the whale for three days, three nights, possibly bleached white from the whole acid of the stomach of the fish. You know, I don't think he looks like he used to. I can imagine he comes out of that thing looking very different than how he went in. And now he's going to be obedient to God. But it's this begrudging disobedience. He's now going to obey God because basically God is forcing him to. But watch how the story unfolds. It says in chapter 3, Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and he went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Possibly go around it actually might be a better translation. It's about 500 miles away from the coast. So it's a long trek just to get to Nineveh. Ancient Nineveh had two walls. It had an inner and an outer wall. And the inner wall was 50 feet thick and 100 feet high. It covered eight miles around. So it was a huge city uh, for the ancient world. Its city-state of land and villages was about 60 miles in circumference. So when it says three days journey, it doesn't mean through the actual town, but maybe through the territory of Nineveh, because it would control all the surrounding land as well. And so he goes to the city of Nineveh, which would be all the territory that Nineveh controlled, and he begins preaching there. And here's his message. Jonah began going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. This is the proclamation he issued to Nineveh. By the decree of the king and of his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink. But let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from His fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, He relented and He did not bring on them the destruction He had threatened. So Jonah hits the town looking like however he looked coming out of the belly of that fish and his 500-mile journey to get there, most likely on foot. He starts walking through the city, and it's interesting because his message is not, God of heaven loves you and wants you to be with Him. He has a wonderful plan for your life. Here's four spiritual laws for you to learn, right? He doesn't have that message. His message is, You are such an evil, wicked empire. You're so deserving of destruction that you have 40 more days and God will destroy you. 40 days and God will destroy Nineveh. 40 days and God will destroy Nineveh. He's walking through there. And actually the response of the people is, yeah, we kind of saw this coming. We already suspected. We already kind of knew. We're the ones living with ourselves. We know we're broken. We know we're hurting. We know we're wounded. We know there's violence here. We know that there's insult and corruption. We know we're so aware of our own dirty ugliness that it doesn't take much for you to tell us God's not happy. When our church was down amongst the street people of Spokane, it doesn't take much for them to be, to know that. You don't have to go down there and talk to people about being in a dark, sinful world. They already live in it. Every single day they wake up, they understand corruption. They understand thieving. I mean, I can't tell you the number of times best friends would camp together for five, six months and sleep out under the bridge together and guard each other and protect each other. And one day one of the friends would just wake up in the middle of the night, grab all the dude's stuff, and off they'd go, never to be seen again. I can't tell you all the times they traded and swapped girlfriends. can't tell you all the times girls did whatever they had to do. I had girls tell me things that they had to do just to get cigarettes. 
You know, taught, you know, the families that they came from and the beatings that they took. And every time that they've tried to crawl out of that hole that they were in, the way that the system would push them back down or the way that they could, they'd kept losing and they never could figure out why. When you're living in the level of destruction of ugliness and awfulness, it doesn't take much to convince you, yeah, God's probably not with us. And I understand God's probably angry. I understand we're not living right. If this is what the world is, it's a dark and it's an ugly place and you don't have to convince us that this is sin. We already know it. We could tell you more stories about how bad it really is to live here. Every now and then a homeless guy would die and run over by a truck in a back alley, found frozen to death under the freeway. It happens four or five times a year. And I would have in the meals, I would have guys coming up to me and they would say stuff like, hey, Pastor Rob, I, I never really said this to anybody, but I didn't think I'd be out here this long. And I don't want to die out here. I, I don't want to die here. It would hit them. They knew. They knew everything was wrong and everything was broken. And also deep inside them there was this hunger and this desire and this ambition for a different kind of life. I wish life wasn't like this, but it is. And Pastor Rob, I, I don't want to die out here. Guys who've been living on the street for years would say that. Jonah's going through Nineveh and it doesn't take much to convince these people it's wrong. When word finally reaches the king, 40 days. You got 40 days. And the king's like, I believe it. And the king, he's in charge of everything. He's like, no kidding. I've been trying to hold this place together. I've been trying to make laws. I've been trying to make things happen here. Let me tell you, these people that I'm ruling over, they deserve a good destruction. He knows it. The king knows it too. And instead he says, all right, we got one shot. Maybe as a collective society, we repent for all of our evilness to each other. The way we have cheated each other and lied to each other and done violence to each other and corrupted our court systems and corrupted our laws. And maybe we got one shot, which is everybody repents for the wickedness that everybody has each done to their neighbor in some capacity. So he proclaims, everybody, put sackcloth on your animals. This is funeral. That's what this means. When you dress up in sackcloth, it's like a gunny sack, really rough material. You're, you, you take all the comforts away. No fine silks, no fine robes. You put on itchy, scratchy, uncomfortable material to remind you that you're in this burdens, burdensome place. Nobody eats anything. There'll be no festivities. And we're going to spend days praying to this new God we've never heard of who's about to come and destroy us. And they do, and they repent. And God sees their sorrow. He sees their admission of guilt. He sees them sorry about the guilt, uh, the, the crimes they have done, and he relents from the destruction. He says, good, okay, they've repented. They've really done what I always wanted them to do, which is turn from their sin and come, come to me. And so Jonah's preaching has worked, absolutely worked, and saved them. And here's Jonah's response in chapter 4. But to Jonah... This seemed very wrong, and he became angry. He prayed to Yahweh, Isn't this what I said, Yahweh, when I was still at home, that this is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish? I knew that you were a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it's better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry? Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in the shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. Love this thing of Jonah. He's walking through the city. You're all going to be dead people. God's coming in 40 days. He's going to wipe all of you up because you're wicked, you're evil, you're vile, you're ugly, I can't stand you. You deserve a good destruction. you got 40 days. Now, if you repent, God might turn and He might love you. But I hope He doesn't do that because you're going to be destroyed in 40 days. He marches through the city. That's His message. Climbs the hillside, sits down on the hill, and waits to watch the city get destroyed. And that's what He really wants to happen. He wants these Assyrians to be wiped out. He wants this empire to collapse. He wants this great city of Nineveh to be destroyed for all the evil it has done. And instead, God doesn't. God watches the reaction of the Ninevites, the Assyrians that are there, and He relents of the punishment. 
And he gives them forgiveness. And he gives them grace. And he wipes over the city with his hand of mercy. And Jonah looks at God and says, that's why I didn't want to come here. I didn't want to come here because I knew what kind of God you are. And he really knows God. You are gracious. You are kind. You are compassionate. You are slow to anger. You are long-suffering. And you forgive sins. And because I knew that's who you were, I didn't want to introduce you to these people. And dang it, you made me do it anyway. And now look, these people still exist. And that's where Jonah's at, right? Man of God. The man of God, right there. And, I love, and then God has to say, why are you angry? Is it right for you to be angry? And Jonah's like, yeah, it's right for me to be angry. Yes, I am. And he'd gone down, he'd sat down in this shade, and he'd built himself a little shelter. And the Lord God provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. Because I love this. I'm sitting on the hillside, waiting for God to destroy this magnificently huge city, one of the largest cities of the ancient world, wipe everybody out, and I'm sitting on the hillside under the hot sun. I'm a little bit uncomfortable, and God provides shade. And he's like, oh, thank you for having this plant grow. I get to now have shade while I watch thousands of people be destroyed. Right? That's where Jonah's at. My comfort is to sit in the shade that God provides for me while I watch the world burn in some sort of fiery sulfur collapse. That's where Jonah's heart is. It says, But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed onto Jonah's head so that he grew faint, and he wanted to die, and said, It would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, he said. I'm so angry, I wish it were dead. So here God's asking this question, Is it right for you to be angry about the Ninevites? Is it right for you to be angry with them? Jonah's saying, yes, it is. See, and what God's getting at is, who has control here, Jonah? Who's in charge here? D- did, you, d- did you raise these Ninevites up? Did you create them? Do you know their names? Do you know who they are? Do you know the secrets of their heart? Do you know what's going on in their mind? Do you understand their suffering and pain? Do you have any idea who they are? Because God's saying, I do. What right have you to be angry about them? You don't even know them. He provides this plant. The plant dies. He's like, you want to be angry about that? Yes, it's right that I'm angry about the plant. I've lost my shade waiting to watch destruction on these thousands of people. And God's like, did you provide that plant? Did you create that plant? Is that within your power to have done? I did that. Let me do what I'm going to do. At every turn, Jonah wants control of the situation. And at every turn, God's trying to tell him, not only do you not have control, you don't even have the slightest grasp of what's going on. You can't make plants grow. You're a human being. I'm God. I do that. Let God be God. And let man be man. And then God says to him, last few verses, but then the Lord said, you have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. Should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh in which there are more than a 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left and all the animals? God's saying, you have more concern for this plant that provided you shade? You're more angry about this plant coming and going? You're more angry about the death of a plant than you are the fact that there's a 120,000 people And Nineveh, who are so little, they're just toddlers, they can't even tell their right hand from their left hand yet. You want to sit here on the hillside and watch those children who are that young and small be destroyed while you sit in comfort on your hillside in the shade? And when the plant dies, you have more concern for your comfort and your plant than you do for that? And that's where the story ends. Is that a crazy ending? That's the dumbest ending of anything in the Bible, except for the last two chapters of Judges. That's the craziest ending, right? Why did, it's like, okay, something else should happen here. History would actually record that in 765, uh, there was a famine, two famines, 765 B.C., 759 B.C. So in a seven-year period, there were these two huge famines, and there was an eclipse in 759 B.C., And for a while, the Assyrian Empire actually did sort of completely change its ways. And then the next king would arise, and 
It would only last that one generation. And the next king who would arise would be as wicked as any before, and he would actually move down and invade and destroy all of Israel. And ten of the twelve tribes would be sent into slavery, most of them annihilated, but the remaining would be absorbed into the Assyrian Empire and scattered throughout it. They're referred to this day as the lost tribes of Israel. The interesting thing is that Jonah ends with a man of God angry that God's going to have mercy and grace on a people that he doesn't think deserve it. But God wants to have grace and mercy on them. This, I cannot possibly think of a more appropriate time in our society than where we're at right now with us being divided into all these ridiculous groups of left and right and, and you know, Republican and Democrat and Trump and Hillary and liberal and conservative and black and white and Hispanic. Right now, we are living in such an age of divisiveness where groups are sort of uh, being pushed into little camps of who's who, which camp do you belong in, and all the other camps are your enemy. And God is probably trying to say to us, hey, I love those people. And he's like, oh, you don't mean those people. <laughs> yeah, because I'm not meeting with them. God's like, yeah, those people. Whoever the those people might be. And God is saying, I am after you, church, to be these agents of grace. Let me have grace and mercy on whom I want to have grace and mercy on. Let me be the one to decide who actually has the heart and the mind that's actually closer to me than you would ever realize because they're not in your camp and you're so sure that your camp is the one I'm with. And God's going to be saying to some of us, this is the season. And that's why the book ends without an answer. Because the truth is, that's all of us, isn't it? Hanging in the answer. What will you do? And Jonah ends with no answer because it leaves each of us looking at, wait, wait, I'm the person of God. Wait, wait, God has told me to be the proclaimer of His Word. If I've become a Christian, I'm supposed to spread that message. All the New Testament tells me that. I'm supposed to share His love. Wait, I'm Jonah. And there's a bunch of folk I would rather not tell the truth of God to. That'd be fine if they perish. Give me the nice people, Jesus, who I already like, who are somewhat like me already. Let me tell them about your love. Let me tell them about your grace and your mercy. And God might be reaching out to each of us in this day and age and saying the reason I'm actually making society so polarized is when it's all done and all these little polar factions are going to happen and everybody's against everybody else, that I'm going to have my church go out and break all those barriers down. And I'm going to have my children go out and infiltrate the camps that they're not naturally a part of and listen and hear and become an agent of my grace and mercy and become one who proclaims the truth of the Gospel too. That there is a God in heaven, and He rules over the sea and the land. And He would send His very Son to die for anyone who would believe. That whosoever believes... Oh yeah, we know when you say that, God, you don't mean these people. Whosoever believes. And how will they believe if they do not hear? And how will they hear if no one proclaims? And how can anyone proclaim if they aren't sent? The Scriptures say. And the weird thing for you and I is like, well, yeah, that's someone else's job. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go down to the belly of the boat and I'm going to go to sleep. Because I got mine. Well, while the world around you is getting pretty chaotic right now, it's starting to burn, it's starting to fall apart, it's starting to be destroyed, and you're like, yeah, that's okay, because you know I'm going to go to sleep in the belly of the boat. Wake me up when it's done. And maybe God's saying, you're awake now. You're awake now, church. I need you now. I need you now going places. I need you now reaching across divides. I need you now talking to people who aren't from your ethnic group. I need you now to listen to stories of others. I need you now to go to the Republican or go to the Democrat or talk with the liberal or talk with the conservative. I need you now to share my story. Because now is when love and grace are needed. And over the next year, it's already happening. You guys already see it. Over the next year, all of society is going to try to divide and pitch and wound you and anger you and put posts on your Facebook and social media is going to happen and, and uh, mainstream media is going to come at you and they're going to try to make you angry and put pitch you against another people group. That's what's already happening. Y'all are seeing it. 
And in this, every time you feel that happening to you inside, go, oh, whoa, God, is this my people group? Is this who you want to send me to for love? Is this the group you want me talking to? Use it as your sense of God is calling me to bridge the gaps. God is calling me to be an agent of peace. God is calling me to share His love. And use all of that energy that's being spent to divide you, pit you against others, kill you, destroy you, wound, tear, rip us apart. Instead say, oh yeah, i got to be on guard. i got to guard my heart against that. i got to make sure that my heart stays open to say, hey God, if you're going to spare the Assyrians, and if ever there was a people group who didn't deserve sparing, it was the Assyrians, then most surely there's people groups here in the United States that you want me to share love with. Whomever they may be. Let's stand and pray. Jesus, uh, I get it now. The story of Jonah is not about the fish. It never was about the fish. The story of Jonah is about the heart attitude of Your people. It's about those who have been given Your truth, who have awareness of You, and are trying to run from You, disobey You, and ignore You. The story of Jonah is about us. So Lord, we stand here today and we say, Lord, I'm going to ask for one thing. Protect my heart from becoming bitter and angry over the next year as we watch our collective society try to wound, separate, divide, and enrage us. Protect my heart from that. Protect all of our hearts from that. Lord God, put a call on us to tell us who it is we're supposed to reach, where we're supposed to have compassion, and where we're supposed to have love. And then, Lord God, We know You are a gracious, kind, compassionate God who is slow to anger and who is long-suffering and gracious and merciful to those who want to hear who You are. Let us sit in the nature of Your character and let us speak as agents slow to anger, full of kindness and compassion, tenderness and mercy, and willing to forgive. Lord, make us something different than where society seems to be going right now. Make us a different kind of influence. Make us salt in the earth. Make us light in the earth. This we ask in Your holy name. Amen. God bless you guys. We'll see you next week.